What's going on, everybody? Hope you are having a wonderful week so far. Uh, before we start the podcast, um, please hit subscribe. Please give us a review after once you've listened to it. Um, I love it. I love doing this podcast. I've really grown to enjoy it even more. Um, and the more subscribers and the more reviews we get, the more likely it carries on. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that. So, podcast time. I am really excited about this this episode. DJ Bone really doesn't need any introduction, but is one of the Detroit founders of techno he has been part of a movement from detroit from pretty much the get-go of detroit techno obviously me living in detroit is i have a, a fond thing for learning about the history and teaching or talking to people to teach me about the history and teach others about the history of detroit and i think it's really important but i was um i saw some instagram obviously i've I've known of dj bone for years i've known of his music i've known what his importance is in the scene but i didn't really know him as a person and then i saw him playing some of my records and i was like jesus christ dj bone is playing my records and we got talking on instagram um and then he asked me to play for his homeless homies show in amsterdam at ade um we met and then I we decided to do a podcast. This guy is one of the nicest people in the industry that I've met. Um, very humble. He does a lot for the community. He has a charity called Homeless Homies, which helps um, homeless people in many ways. Um, so in the description below, I've actually put the um, donation link. If you want to go and donate, please do, even if it's two bucks even if it's one buck whatever you can that would be great i don't often ask people to donate or i never ask people to donate but what um dj bone and his wife Anne are doing is super special um so yeah i'm gonna leave you all with the conversation so without further ado dj bone dj bone what's cooking man what up though you all right well yeah good how are you uh, i'm good man i'm good where are you right now I'm in San Francisco. Nice. Uh, played last night. Uh, small week weekday gig yeah. uh, called F8. F8. How was it? It was good. Yeah. It's good. It's just really small venue, but uh, really great people and good vibe. Mm, love that. I I was yeah. actually in San Fran this weekend as well. I played Friday. I Friday, saw. Friday I was night. like, we just missed you. Yeah. It's San Fran's changed a lot, hasn't it? It has, man. It's changed since it, COVID. <laughs> it's it's almost like everywhere has changed yeah and i think what it is is when you go back to spots you you used to frequent it's kind of shocking mm. when you see it you're like wow i remember it used to be like this yeah it's so different yeah i think for me that i found as well like obviously san francisco was a, a really big city for me pre-covid mm -hmm. and obviously covid happened and San Francisco. I th personally, I think San Francisco got hit the mo the hardest in America, um, and then the homeless got even worse, and it's just like it's carnage out there now. And I think what <laughs> happened a lot of yeah. a lot of the scene just left, and it's now like having to rebuild. It's really sad. It is having to rebuild. We noticed that because every time I play this event, you know the F eight, it's like packed, packed. Yeah. I mean, even it's so weird because it seems like every time I come out uh, to San Fran, it rains. Every single time, my friends hate it. They're like, man, every time you come, it rains. But uh, I'd say 2018, I came out, you know, pre COVID, and it was raining cats and dogs. And we were so upset because we were like on our way to the club thinking, damn, nobody's going to be there. Yeah. Because it never rains in SF. So mm -hmm. we're like, great. You know, nobody's going to come out in this. And we got there, and there's a line out the building, down Love the block, it. in the rain. And I was Love like, it. damn. And then you fast forward to after lockdown, and it's, like, completely different. Yeah. You know, the, the promoters are struggling. Yeah. And 
the venues are struggling and the crowd has, has flipped, you know, so it's a whole different vibe on top of that. Completely different vibe. Completely yeah. different vibe. Like for me beforehand, <clears throat> it was more like it was a party crowd, like real yep. party crowd and they wanted to go. And like for me, I've done two shows post pandemic in San Fran and it's been a tough crowd. Like they, people have showed up, people have come, but it's a different yeah. crowd. It's more of a, it's more of a tech crowd. It's more of people that don't really go to clubs. That's yeah. That's the weird part. Yeah, They're, it's like this social gathering type yeah. vibe. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to like a party party. Yeah, it's really weird. And then you throw in the landscape with uh, when you leave the the club, yeah, or the 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 gig of all the homeless people. And it's shocking, man. We went out yesterday. Uh, we're staying downtown. We went, we went uh, first thing in the morning and had breakfast and bought a ton of breakfast yeah. to just walk around and hand out yeah, to I as many people as we could. Yeah. Because it was just, it was bad to begin with, but we saw how, how much worse it's gotten and we were in complete shock, man. It's It's really actually worrying to me. Like my first show back in San Francisco was last year um i can't remember exactly the, the date um but when i noticed it the most it was this year like january this time this year and me and my manager were walking through tenderloin and tenderloin's always been bad it's always been bad yeah. but <clears throat> it was like people shooting up on every doorstep dealers on every corner people like smoking in, in every single car like it was bad yeah. and like i like well you grew up in detroit you're from detroit yeah. you've grew up in not necessarily grew up but you've you've witnessed rough areas of of america and 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 kind of more poverty trodden areas in america and san, yeah. san fran is like one of the wealthiest cities in the world and you yeah. have that and there's just something so fucked about it so it is it's so backwards fucking yeah. backwards man I mean, I remember, like, being on the east side of Detroit, yeah. you know, going to my cousin's house, me and, me and my homies from, from high school, mm. and we would walk, and you had to dodge, like, on the street, little empty crack vials yeah. and, and needles to make sure you wouldn't step on that shit. And that was, sadly, normal, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But to, to fast forward to now, you know, so many years later... It's the same. And I'm seeing it here and I'm like, yeah. fuck. And people are warning us, like, be careful. We know you're trying to help, you know, and feed the homeless, but they're walking around out here with syringes in their hands. Yeah. So don't get poked. And I'm like, what the fuck is yeah, yeah. What's going on? It's bad. You know, and it's a lot of mental health issues because every single person we, we helped yesterday, when we, when we walked up on them, they were either knocked out, like, mm. you know, in a haze or they were talking to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And it was just so sad, man. I think I think I think it's it's really interesting because I I don't know if you know my background, but I my parents own a drug and alcohol rehab. Really, and, I didn't yeah, know that. And I've my mum's always worked in rehabs my my whole life. So like I grew up <clears throat> going to work with her when I was a kid and going to wow. going to rehab. So I've like been around that a lot of, in my life, and it's amazing what we do in England for addiction and mental health like we're super lucky with that and yeah. it, it we're, we're really lucky with what we do for the homeless and kind of helping people even if you're not homeless just single mothers like everything we do we support the people yeah um and we i think people in england don't realize how lucky we have it um and then fast forward to america which is the wealthiest country in the world and you've got this huge mental health crisis that just seems to be getting worse and worse yet people are paying more people are paying more taxes people are paying more for rent and everything like that and it just doesn't seem to go anywhere no no and it's a drop in the bucket to what they need to do you know we feel bad because when we go to west coast when we come to san fran we're going to la next yeah and we want to do so much to help we, we try and organize something in LA and we're like, okay, we're going to feed the homeless on this day, you know, in this area. And then we go down there, 
you know, to try and scout out what we would need to do and how we can work the logistics. And there's just so many people yeah. that we're like, okay, even when we do do this and we pull it off, what about tomorrow or yeah. the next day? Yeah. So yeah, we fed people for one day, but they got to eat again tomorrow. Yeah. You know what I mean? So now we're trying to to speak more to the people who can implement solutions to to help. We we raise money to help build tiny houses. Yeah. Um, to get people, but there's a huge conundrum because the guy who did it is like, not every person wants to, mm. you know, live in a tiny house or some people choose to be on the street. They choose to be homeless. So what can you do for them? You know? And I was like, man, it's just such a tough, a tight situation, man. It's really tough. And like, I don't know what the solution is at all, but I think the main from what i think and this i don't really want to go into politics because i'm not political at all really but mm -hmm. from podcasts that i've listened to previously about the homeless issues and things like that like la gets a billion dollars a year to help the homeless like and there's still more and more homeless on the streets like I'm, I, I, <laughs> exactly. I, I don't like i understand some people choose to be homeless like I've I've met people in my parents' rehab that like the first month they move they move into the rehab they still sleep on the floor because that's what they've been used to for the last thirty years. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. Th it's still like you eventually evolve and you eventually change as a human being, and we can't just expect people to change overnight. We have to give them time, no. and, and you have to you have to allow them. But like the amount of money that's being spent. But where's that money going? It's not going. It's going into their back pockets. It's exactly, exactly. And they don't have to legally. The sad part is legally they don't have to spend all of it. No. On, on the main issue. No, they're all earning you know, two hundred fifty thousand, three hundred thousand a year to fix the problem, and they're not. That's where the money's going to them, and it's just it's and it's super just sad. Temporary. It's band aids. It's not. It's not uh, solutions. It's a just temporary fix. Yeah. And yeah. what happens is. If if the people who are homeless don't have an an inkling of hope, then then why should they even think about you know a new life or a different life? If all they're worried about is okay, today's goal is eating mm. and sleeping somewhere safe. That's it. Yeah. That's not hope. You know, that's survival. That's basic survival. Yeah. Food, clothing, shelter. So if you could give them hope as to you know, being drug or alcohol free yeah. or having help with their mental uh, issues or getting a job mm -hmm. or having a, to be able to sustain a pet, you know, in a home or just something where they, they say, OK, that's my goal. Yeah. So now I'm excited about trying to have a new and better life, you yeah. know, and better conditions and safer conditions and get healthy, you know. But if you don't give any anyone those those glimpses of hope then they're just they're just surviving yeah you know and, and they'll do what they have to do to survive and i don't think like i don't think that's just with homeless as well i think that's with a lot of people generally it's like a lot of people out there are just do they just go ticking along with life because they have to because it costs so much for them and they yeah. just have to put the hours in and it's like I, I now I, I live in Detroit, like I see it all the time. And it's like, Man. it's so sad that we live in a world where there's so much wealth and that wealth, I, I'm cool for people making money. I I, I, yeah. I actually have no issue with very wealthy people. I, I haven't, I, and I think a lot of very wealthy people give a lot of money to, yes, it's tax breaks, but whatever, give it to people. And, and, yeah. and make, but I think it's just how, there's communities of people that are all could be really <laughs> fucking talented people. They could all give so much to the world and it just, they just, they don't even leave the block. I know, I know, man. And it, it's frustrating, you know? And that's why when I got to a certain level, when I, when I met on, when I met my, my wife yeah. and we clicked and we started talking about our past and talking about uh, basically how we like to help you know, the homeless community and we, we were on a level of talking to them. I was in Detroit and I, I knew almost every homeless person downtown. Yeah. I knew them. I knew where they'd be. 
I knew like majority of their names, their situations, and we'd ride around Detroit. And I remember first when she first came to Detroit. There's this guy walking down the street, and he was uh, he used to do this thing where he'd try and make people think he was crazy, like you know, like so they wouldn't fuck with him. Yeah. So he'll walk down the street and he's like ah, ah, talking to himself and doing these motions, you know, looking really aggressive. Yeah. So we pull the car over to the side and he's walking down the street, coming towards the car. And then she's looking at me like, uh, why are you sitting here? And this guy, this crazy guy is coming, you know, he's going to run up on the car. And I said, watch this. And I rolled down the window and he was walking up and I just leaned over and I go, Hey, and I looked at him and he looked at me and he goes, and he just got really quiet. Yeah. And then he just walked down the street because mm. I told him it wasn't good for him to do that. Yeah. Cause eventually he could become that. Yeah. You know what I mean? But we would go around and she saw, you know, the situation in Detroit was bad, but it wasn't as bad as where she was, you know, living in LA. Yeah, no way near as bad. That's when we said, you know, we could do something, you know, and help some people. Mm. You know, and we, we did some really good stuff and So did it, it start feels, it started in America, the whole homeless yeah, homies thing? Okay. It, it started in De in Detroit. Mm. It was the first uh things we did. And we would just do little, you know, acts of kindness and, and see what we could do. Make sure that we could feed some people, take uh, cases of White Castle mm. burgers yeah. to the <laughs> to the the homeless shelter. Yeah. Because uh, there's one across from the train station we should uh, take care of all the time. And what it is is they have to line up outside really early mm. and that's just, just to make sure they that they can get a bed because there's not enough beds for everybody Fuck. so they're outside whether it's heat or cold or so we would go there thanksgiving or you know usually in the winter time yeah and we would bring drinks and bring you know white castles yeah. and we'd show up and they're like oh bones yeah white castle man is here you know and, just, <laughs> and it was cool because it was so civil to the point where if we're telling people here take a couple of burgers and they're like no 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 make sure everybody gets one first mm. i don't want to take two yet yeah love that you know mm. that's that's humanity you know totally. that's respect for your fellow man and woman and it just touched our heart you mm. know from that point on we were like we have to do some more and that's when she would come up with ideas like okay let's do this let's do that and then we decided that you know when late when the label stopped making as much money as it used to when yeah, music yeah. was paying people we just decided okay whatever we we make off the label we'll just put an account mm -hmm. and then that's going to go towards uh the homeless homies and we did that in 2002 yeah we decided yeah. that amazing you know so i mean it feels good that's the the key is it's a service that makes us it really we were like on such a a good vibe yesterday yeah because we felt we helped some people it was little as it was mm -hmm. just to see the look on their faces you know the looks on their faces and and the, it's just amazing we came across some of everybody this this one couple was living in their car right around the corner you know downtown where all the fancy shops are yeah there's a couple with their dog in the car mm. and it was full it was tons of stuff in the car tons of stuff out of the car you know, the dog came running out the car, sniffing the food. Yeah. <laughs> what was the dog's name? Yeah, they're like, Arthur, get back here. Get back here, Arthur. <laughs> so we gave him one for Arthur, too. It was like, here, give us some sausages or something. I think that's the ama but, amazing <clears throat> thing, though, about giving back. It actually makes you feel better. And yep. it's kind of like therapy for yourself. Although, in in like a selfish way, it's like, but it's also not selfish because you're helping people. Yeah. Yeah. And and we always tell each other we have enough. Yeah. That's the one thing we always look at each other and say, we have plenty. So when, when, when how much extra do we need? You know, when in your career did you get to that point where you were like, I have enough now? Because I uh, or is that is that a career thing or is that an age thing? It was both. Yeah. To be honest, it was both. It was no, it was three things. It was career, age and when I met my wife. Yes. Yeah. Because especially in Detroit and in most inner cities, a lot of young black men were never taught about finance. Yeah. About how to, you know, brothers can make money. Yeah. yeah. Brothers can find a way to make money, mm -hmm. but they might not know how to save money. Manage it. Or how to invest yeah. money. Yeah, yeah. 
right? So the streets don't teach you that shit. They teach you how to hustle, but they don't teach you how to save. Yeah. <clears throat> so you're out there trying to buy the, you know, this car, put rims on it, sound system, big gold chain. You know what I'm saying? You see, Gucci you this, see Gucci it every that. day. You see it every day. But how many people have a 401k? How many people have a retirement plan? Who's yeah. invested in real estate? You know? Yeah. So I think it got to that point because I would make money, really good money, and I wouldn't hold on to it. Yeah. I would waste it. You know, but the cool thing was most of the what I wasted my money on early was gear. Yeah. So at least I was investing in my career. Yourself. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it wasn't real estate or anything, but it, it was gear, vinyl, you know. And then my wife is an accountant. That's always so good. She just <laughs> dropped the knowledge on me and was like, this is how you save money. This is how you do that. So we started the system where we'll pay ourselves first. Yeah. Every month. Whatever we made from the month, we take a certain amount, 20%, whatever, and pay ourselves. Yeah. Then the rest of it. So now that's like an, an obligation you have. And the rest of it goes, you start towards bills. Yeah. And then that, and then you have whatever's left over. And then the next thing you know, you turn around a few years later and that 20% that you paid yourself every month just blew up. Yeah. So now we're like, oh shit, you know, yeah, yeah. we did have extra. Yeah. If you put, cause usually people spend, spend, and then they say, okay, I have this left that's extra. Mm -hmm. But if you take the money out first and then you say, okay, now with the rest of it, I can take care of finances and all that. And that's how it worked. So it was a combination of that uh, the career where the fee would go up yeah. or I would get busy, busier, you know, and with age, you, as they say, you get wiser, you know, as you get older, not, not everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know a lot of stupid ass older people, man, but, you know, and I know a lot of smart, really smart young people. Yeah. So, you know, that, that kind of went out the window, but it's, I think that has more to do with how you grow up. Yeah. How was your upbringing? Like you how, how was your upbringing? It was good. Yeah. It was good. I mean, <clears throat> it was good. It was dangerous. Mm. But to see, people don't know, it, it, there's a stigma that happens. You know, like when a black person, like I call it the Obama syndrome. Mm. If you speak well, if you're articulate, yeah. if you have a certain uh, level of intelligence, then a lot of the black community will tend to say, oh, he's he's a white brother, or, you know. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, you just bettered yourself and yeah. you got a good education and you were lucky enough, mm -hmm. you know. <clears throat> and in the hood, we call it code switching. I've never so heard that saying. What'd you say? I've never heard that saying. Oh, you never heard I've it? Never code heard switching. that saying. So what happens is you have almost like two personas. Okay. The one in your hood where you grew up in the neighborhood, where you're hanging out with your homies, you know, your people in the hood, your family, whoever. Yeah. And you can say and do certain things and act a certain way. But then when you go into the corporate world, yeah, then you can't necessarily bring that hood mentality into that situation. Yeah. Because it's not going to benefit you. Yeah. You, it's kind of like uh, when Dave Chappelle was up on stage dropping an M bomb. You know, yep. I was at home laughing my ass off and I'm watching it with all my friends and we're getting every single joke, joke yeah, and it's course. no big deal yeah, yeah. because we grew up with it. Our parents and grandparents and everybody used to, you know, play cards and say that shit. Yeah. But he said he, he looked at the crowd and saw a bunch of white people and they weren't laughing with him. They were laughing at him. Mm. And that's when it, it clicked and he was like, damn, this isn't the venue for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's certain shit that was in the hood that didn't need to leave the hood, you know, and it's it's a it's a weird dichotomy, but that's how I grew up. So I was in the hood, man. I was on Northwest Side of Detroit. Yeah. Uh Grand River and Finkel. And I caught the bus to school. And the thing is, I had to I went to Cast Tech. Okay. And for people who don't know, Cast Tech is a, a technical school. It's a, uh, it's like a college prep school. Yeah. Now it's a public school. And what happens in Detroit is wherever you live in that neighborhood, that's what school you go to basically. Yeah. Right. So wherever you live, that's the school you go to. It's just regional. Mm -hmm. But with Cast Tech, 
it was only one of two high schools in the city where you had to take a test to get in. Ah, okay. Because it was a vocational school, you had a curriculum, and it was advanced. It was yeah. really advanced. So I was lucky that my mom just woke me up when I was like, get get dressed, I got to take you down for this test. And I was like, what? You know, because I was in eighth grade and I was like, what is this? She's like, this is for high school. And I'm like, why would I have to take a test? You know, Redford is right there. She's like, nope, you got to take a test. I thought I was going to be going to Cooley or something. <laughs> and then I went, and <laughs> you know about Cooley. <laughs> Cooley yeah. High. And then uh, got in and went in there and I was like, just opened that that high school changed my life really wow and a lot of people went there big sean went to Cass tech mm. Aaliyah went to Cass tech yeah we have so many great alumni like if you google Cass tech detroit alumni you won't believe really? the people who went there yeah yeah anyone who watches the the watches this they should do that Cass tech detroit alumni and they're gonna be like that school has turned out some amazing people yeah and it's not just uh, an art school. Mm. It's uh, they would they would have classes for auto mechanic, you know. Yeah. For I wasn't even in I was in music classes, but my main thing was architecture. Oh, really? Architectural design, yeah. Drafting you, and architecture. Did you study that after? I did. Yeah. Only wow. for like two years. Yeah. When we went to university at Wayne State. Nice. But then I realized how much. Well, my, my high school teacher, one of them, Mr. Katie, he always told us, he was like, I know you guys want to be architects and this and that, and I'm here to teach you and I'm here to help you learn, but if you don't get, you know, into an apprenticeship, I'm going to tell you exactly how it's going to go. And he would break it down raw, you know, yeah. like you're going to spend this much time in college, you're going to get out, you're going to have to do an apprenticeship, you don't get paid shit, you're going to do this, and then at the end of all that, you're only going to make this much money. Yeah. And we were like, what? He goes, so now you got to pay back your student loans. He was breaking it down. So he was setting up apprenticeships for people while they were in high school. Oh, wow. So which, you were ahead which, of the curve. Which realistically, like, let's be honest, let's be real, especially in America. Like, <clears throat> why aren't people doing that now? Because it's like, <laughs> like, why is it still so backwards? Because like the amount of money it costs to go to university <laughs> is ridiculous. I'm sorry. I'm laughing, man. It's, <laughs> We have tried to figure this shit out and we stopped because it it drive you insane trying to figure. I swear, if you try to figure out, like you said, not to be political, but if you try to figure out education yeah. in America, the healthcare system yeah. oof, in America, um, I mean, just certain basic human rights and yeah. certain uh, things that if you, if you invest in people, then they're going to make your community better, right? Yeah. But if you make your people go broke, then they're not really going to take care of, yep. of the environment of the that's community. around them. Yeah. Or the people who made them broke. <laughs> you know what I mean? Of course. My, my saying is the way we make a better world is make everyone rich. And, that, and, and I think life's not about money. It's really not. Like we can all enjoy a lot of things. Like I, like my, I grew up poor when I was a lot younger and we, we had nothing, but we, we still had the best time as a family. Um, but my parents were surrounded around people that worked hard and they worked hard and became very successful. And, but I think if you, if you're surrounded by people that aren't necessarily successful and aren't putting the drive in and aren't doing all of that when, and in America you have communities of that, like generations yeah. and generations of that. Yeah. And that's when, yeah, no one, no one earns great money. Everyone gets fucked over and then you just, it's a circle, circle of. And then poverty. that circle gets darker and darker Yeah, where you start to either lash out or you might say, okay, you know, I like what they got. I'm not going to work for it. I'm going to take it. Exactly. You know what I mean? Well, I might carjack somebody. I might do this and it's not for survival. It's out of, you know, anger and frustration and yeah. hate. Well, it's you also know? like, I don't want to kind of downgrade people that do it as well, but it's also like, I have nothing to live for. Yeah, yeah. And if I have nothing like to live no for. no hope, no prospects. And what's the point? Fuck it. Like, exactly. fuck it. And, and I think that's where 
it kind of the buck kind of stops whereas like you you have to help a whole community it's like let's say for instance the school like Kaz Tech like mm-hmm. education changes kids lives changes oh, kids lives seriously like if you didn't go to Kaz Tech we probably wouldn't be having this conversation today no no and it was a it was a double edged sword for me because like I said I had to catch the bus right yeah so Cast Tech, it's so funny. I live in Northwest Detroit when I was growing up. Yeah. And that's like Grand River Finkel. Mm-hmm. Cast Tech was Grand River and Cass downtown. Yeah. So it's a 45 minute bus ride. Mm-hmm. Right. Anyway, where you're going or coming back home, you have to pass by at least three different uh, public high schools. Yeah. You know, like some, some raw ass yeah. high schools. The neighborhood ones where you're like, okay, you know, this isn't even my hood. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going through four different hoods to get to my high school and then coming back. So you would have to fight every other day. Yeah. Get into an argument. But you had to stand your ground because they thought everybody cast was soft. Yeah. Because it was a school for smart kids. Mm. But they didn't realize, you know, a lot of these kids live in a hood. Yeah. And they're trying to get out of that situation. They just happened to go to cast. Mm. So... <clears throat> There was a little divide, you know, in the cast tech because there were a lot of, you know, wealthy kids there. Of course. And yeah. the, the kids who came from well-to-do families. But, you know, so I'm at, at this amazing school and I get all this good energy. And then I got to go and ride the bus and make sure that I have enough of my friends with me in case something pops <laughs> off <laughs> that we can handle it. You know what I mean? <laughs> it was crazy, man. Oh, That's why man. It's, it's, it's just, you know, I wouldn't trade it. No, it's but, made you who you are today. Yeah, it doesn't make it a, a a good. It makes a good story, but it's not. It wasn't a good situation. It, it, yeah, you're right. It's made you who you are. It's, it's a great story, but it doesn't mean that it's right. Yeah, I mean, growing up here in gunshots every night is just not good, dude. I can talk about it. I, like when <clears> I moved <throat> to Detroit, like in the first year, like my next door neighbor's house got shot up in broad daylight. <laughs> Welcome to Detroit. <laughs> and like, there's, I don't know if you've heard of that app called Citizen. Oh no, I think I have. It's wild. Don't download it. You're <laughs> you're literally, especially in Detroit, because it tells you all the crime oh. that's going on lo- locally in the in the area. And yep. it's like literally like you you hear it's it's the same for me. It's like you hear gunshots regularly, and you then see like woman stabbed man on a freeway 300 yards away and you're like fuck like this is this is real and and i I think it's like an eye-opener like we're so lucky like obviously you live in multiple places but living in in amsterdam or the netherlands like we're so lucky in certain in europe in on 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 that level like we can walk down the street and not have to worry. And you know, the the only downside to that for me is I didn't even realize that I had developed PTSD yeah. from growing up in Detroit. Yeah, I bet. Loud noises, yeah. you know, always watching over my shoulder. And it's funny because Ann and I decided that we were going to go see this cranial sacral uh, therapist, mm. you know, because she has anxiety and she needed some uh, some help with the anxiety. Yeah. And so she signed me up, too, because she's like, well, you live with me. <laughs> you deal with my anxiety, so I'm going to get you some help, too. Yeah. So I was like, man, you know, black people, the, the whole school, black people don't believe in therapy. You know, it's not called depression. It's called being sad, and, you know. Yeah. The whole usual shit of the now. And then I went, and it was... It's almost like Reiki, but mm. it, it touches you okay. and he can sense your blood flow. Mm. And if you have any health issues or stress and all this, and he tries to help the blood flow better yeah. and more effective. And it worked. And I was he was telling me things about myself and I was shocked. It was like, you seem like you suffered like some trauma, but it wasn't a physical. He was just telling me all this stuff and he was telling me how I can't relax mm. and how I'm tense. And then he was, before I even laid down and he was doing the process, he was looking at me and he goes, okay, I want you to do one thing. And I was like, well, he goes, do this. Just put your shoulders down. 
He's like, you're always yeah. walking around on the fence, huh? And I was like, damn. So I told him the whole scoop. And I was like, yeah, you know, you do this. And we hear gunshot and all that. And he was like, he said, I'm going to tell you this. And I know it's going to sound simple. And it's n- it's not going to be something you can, you know, it's not going to cure you today. He's like, yeah. you're not in Detroit every day anymore. Yeah. He's like, how often do you go there? I told him, oh, you know, we go back three times a year. He's like, when you're there, you know, do, do your usual. He's like, but when you're here, you're in, you're in, in the Netherlands now. He's like, just put your, he's like, whenever you you feel tense, just stop yourself and then release all the tension in your body. Mm-hmm. And all this time, I never noticed how much I was walking around tensed mm-hmm. up all the time. It makes me sad, man, <clears> if I'm <throat> honest. Like, it makes me really sad <clears throat> thinking about it because, like, like I moved to Detroit. Like I chose to move to Detroit. I was gonna say you, you, that was a. My wife would say that was a choice. <laughs> like <laughs> she looks at me all the time. I do something. She goes, "That was a choice." <laughs> <laughs> like I chose to there. So like I, I kind of knew what I didn't fully know what I was going into, but I I I kind of got the, the gist pretty quickly. Um, but like, and you moved to Detroit, Detroit. Yeah, you didn't go into. Uh, Midtown, no, or Southfield. You were in Detroit, yeah, yeah. Um, but also, like, I think the thing that makes me sad and pretty emotional is that, like, I can leave. You've left, and right now, as we speak, how many people, not just in Detroit, but just it generally, are just suffering from they're going through exactly the same stuff as you went through, and that yeah. we'll never be able to leave. I, I know, man, and and it, it it pains me. You know, that was the hardest decision ever was to leave Detroit. Mm. It was it it was weird. It was like the craziest coin you've ever flipped. Because mm. heads or tails, like stay in Detroit or leave Detroit. I would have loved both. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, but to to like literally move residents, it was tough, but. I got to the point where I said, man, I'm a grown ass man and yeah. I can't sit here and be looking over my shoulder just to go use the ATM or just to pump some gas. Yeah. And, and the more I reconcile with myself that living like that is not normal, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like raising kids in that environment shouldn't 100%. be normal. Yeah. You know, I, I grew up listening to gunshots and having to lay on the floor on New Year's Eve and not be in front of a window because a random bullet might come through because people shoot in the air on New Year's Eve. That's not normal. Trick or treat. And there's, you know, and this is the early days and you got to worry about perverts, razors in the, in the candy and the Snickers and all this. I was like, this shit is not normal. So I reconciled and I was like, I'm out. Yeah. You know, I did my time. You know, now I have to reclaim the second act of my life and yeah. and live peacefully and as worry free as as I want to be, and you know it's a healthier feeling for me all around, and it's cool because you know so many people left, and they I get a little more you know I get criticized a little more than most because I, I was gonna ask I don't you know, maybe people they think that I'm I'm super Detroit yeah. and I you know I am. So when when Jeff left, it wasn't like you know, oh you you left Detroit. When Rob moved to Alabama, when Octave One moved to Atlanta, when Juan went to LA, when Eddie went to LA, K Han went to Atlanta. But when Bone leaves, you left us. Yeah. You abandoned us. I was motherfucker. I, <laughs> <laughs> let, let me live. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Live. You know what I mean? And I it's funny because I would come back to Detroit all the time, but I wasn't necessarily coming back and doing the same shit that I used to do. Yeah. So I come back and I wouldn't play. Yeah. I come back and I wouldn't hang out with the same people, clubs or yeah. bars or restaurants. Yeah. I come back and I would just kick it at the crib yeah. and I would hang out with my family and my friends. Mm. And they had grown and they had kids yeah. and they so that's what I like to do. I like to hang out at a barbecue instead of going to the club. I yeah. like to you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go bowling instead of, you know, kicking in at Belle Isle or something. Because I was I was grown, you know. It's like I don't need to do that shit anymore. Yeah, so my job is hectic enough. Exactly. It, it's people wise yeah. for me to have to tolerate being in crowds and all that shit on an off day. My my worst this sounds terrible and people I it doesn't sound terrible to me. 
and <coughs> it, it probably you can relate, but you will never catch me in a club if I don't have to DJ. <laughs> <laughs> like, unless unless a re- unless a really close friend is playing and I and I have a night off, but if I have yeah. a night off, you're. I'm going to either cook some really nice food for some friends or my family. <laughs> what, go. go watch a film. Like, I am not going to a fucking bed club, like, ever. I mean, I do it very rarely. But yeah. it, like you said, it's got to be close friends are yeah. playing. Yeah. Close friends or, you know, somebody who I really uh, enjoy hearing. Yeah. Yeah, but to, to put yourself in that <laughs> in that environment voluntarily, yeah. Fuck that. <laughs> yeah, yeah you feel like you've outgrown that huh? yeah i to be fair i think the the issue with me is my first ever experience in a club was me dj mm-hmm. oh, so like man. my first show was when i was like 13 and that was my first <laughs> time in a club 13? yeah so i was like I never did that rave thing. I never did the whole like, let's go to clubs, oh, let's go rave, and then shit. let's go do it. I was into like house and techno way before I was even going clubbing. Oh man, that's crazy. I that's that's a gotta be such a weird thing for you. Yeah, so it's like I actually don't enjoy going to clubs. So you've never been a raver, yeah? Never. never. Holy shit, dude! I've never you missed it. Yeah, man. Like, no, I, I, I totally agree. I think there's parts of it that I, I miss massively because yeah. like I've never, I've been to my dad and I would go to festivals together oh, and like nice. he'd take me to, to see shows and stuff like that. But like, I'd never been, I've never been to like a dance music festival to go mm. to a dance music festival. Okay. I've only ever been working at one. So like I see, it completely I see. changes the dynamic for me. It's like if if I go to one and I'm not working, it make I I'm like this is weird. Like I don't enjoy it. <laughs> That's got to be weird for you. <laughs> Super Holy weird. shit! I can't even imagine, yeah. dude. But it's one thing to say, you know, I don't go to clubs and go to festivals. But if you've never been, if that hasn't been, you know, your lifestyle, then it's gonna feel really out of place for you. Yeah, I I love it when I'm going to play. It's my favorite yeah. time. I think it's just like. It's just what you're used to, right? Yeah. You know, people say, do you get nervous? They ask, you know, no, I get excited. I get anxious. Yeah. Like, I'm, I want to play. I want to play. Yeah, yeah, You yeah. know, I'm ready. Get the other DJ off and get on, like. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, inside I'm saying that, but outside I'm like, oh, take your time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> play one more if you want. <laughs> yeah. Unless um, they're rocking. If, I've had a couple of kids where somebody's really, like, killing it, and I don't want to stop them. Yeah. I'm like, this is bad for the party. Yeah. No matter what yeah. I'm going to bring. To stop this DJ now would be bad for this party, and I'm thinking as a whole. Yeah. Because in Detroit, we used to. It was all about the the big picture, you know, for mm. the party, for the event. But sometimes you show up and you you wouldn't play. It's such a old school way of looking at, it. and I I mean old school in the most positive way. <laughs> um. It's changed completely. Oh, wow! It's changed so much that. I mean, everything is to the the minute, the second, the 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 noise meters, the I don't even know, man. Mm. Everything has changed about it, and the business aspect of it is really what turned a lot of artists off. A lot of Detroit people who either don't travel as much, don't yeah. play as much out. They're frustrated. I don't blame them, <clears throat> but like you said, it it. It's to me, it's like a, a version of when I grew up, you learn certain things from the streets, right? Yeah. So I kind of graduated into a, another realm. And it's not like you go streets, then this. No, no it's like streets, then as this. So you add to it yeah, and you yeah. broaden your horizons, right? Yeah. So I got on that tip of, okay, I have to adapt while maintaining who I am. Yeah. How can I do that shit? You know, how did I'm you not, do that? Basically, I listened to people around me. Yeah. I used to be so stubborn and so uh, hard headed yeah. that I wouldn't take any advice. I wouldn't. I was just like, this is the way I'm doing it. And that's that. <clears throat> but then when I started to say, OK, I'll hear you out. 
And then the idea to me that used to sound ridiculous, the ideas, they weren't as ridiculous if I could implement my version of someone else's idea. Yeah. You know, like with social media, mm. you know, it's a double-edged sword. I, I hated it for the longest time. Like hated. Yeah. But everybody's like, oh, it's necessary. I have to do this. And I'm like, it's not really necessary. I said, but if I do it the way I want to do it, then I'll be happy. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to be on there doing some tap dance shit or, you know, having to do what, what they call content. Yeah. You know, I don't know, hanging out the window from a, a bra strap, you know, <laughs> swinging back and forth, you know, while baking a cake. I'm not doing stupid shit, you know yeah. what I mean? Just to get people to say, oh, you know, yeah. I don't know him, but look at that. Yeah. I don't need that attention. I really don't, no. you know, but... I, I try and see the the purpose in things. I try and see the, the the upside of things a lot more than the downside because for so much of my life I saw the downside of a lot of shit. You know. What was the was, difference when you when you when that mentality switched for you though, where you were like the you saw the upside in things? Like, did your life change? Yeah, yeah. Actually, it 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 was a moment for me. Like, you know, I felt kind of enlightened. Yeah. And it wasn't just a social media thing. It wasn't, it was everything. Mm. It was opening myself up to uh, different aspects, whether it's uh, the way I eat, yeah, the way I, I uh, take care of myself, mm. cycling, you know, yeah. in, in Amsterdam. I was like, man, I ain't trying to be riding on no bike. Let's just take an <laughs> Uber, you know? <laughs> but now where we live, you know, a little bit outside of the city, it's rural. So yeah. to ride your bike is a really enjoyable, yeah. you know, meditative thing. You know, we live across from a dairy farm. Wow. You know, so I wake up and it's only 15 minutes from Amsterdam, you know. Yeah. So to wake up and hear these cows mooing and all that, it's a different thing mm. from gunshots. I was going to say, <clears> it's a bit different to gunshots. So that's a different level, but I can still be that guy when I'm in Detroit and turn it on and be like, okay, you know, that's make sure you don't yeah. leave shit in the car, yeah, yeah. lock your door, blah, 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 watch your back. Yeah. You know what I mean? That doesn't go away. Yeah. That's that why when be. people say, oh, he left, I, I left, but Detroit, I took Detroit with me. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, I probably have more Detroit in my, in my body than what's left in certain areas of Detroit 100%. Now. Because you grew you know up, you grew up in the era when Detroit was bad, yeah. And now Detroit is luckily, <laughs> and I'm really happy that it is. It's on the up. It's it's slowly going. There's still terrible places that needs a lot of work being put in. But look, oh yeah, even when I first started going to Detroit eight years ago, nine years ago, you wouldn't go downtown. Like, <laughs> you just wouldn't. You mean I mean, that's where I was going to school. I was going yeah. to school around the corner from what they call Cass Corridor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because do you know the, now? Do you know the girl? Midtown. You know the girls, girls and boys club there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of my friends owns a um, a fashion label called D Deviate Fashion, um, uh -huh. and they have their offices in the girls and boys uh, building. And I think that's pretty really? close. To, yeah, and they do like a lot of a lot of work with um, the Boys and Girls Club where they like teach teach the kids how to like run a fashion label and run business and like create their own fashion. It's really interesting what they're doing. Really interesting. It's necessary, man. I mean, as much as I, <laughs> because that's that's my outlook changed. Remember, yeah. I, you know, I said I enlightened myself. I felt enlightened. Because before I would be upset. I'd be like, man, I have this, I remember my cast corridor was, the real Detroit. And, yeah. But then I'm advocating for a time when the area was just full of drugs yeah. and prostitution and poverty. Mm. So which one is it? Do I want that back? Yeah. Or am I just sick of all the rich white people who came in, yeah. you know, and gentrified the area, you know, but my beef isn't with the people who moved into Detroit. My beef is with the people who decided we're going to develop downtown and ignore the neighborhoods else, yeah so they were developed in midtown but if my street light goes out you know on warwick or auburn i i can't get it 
fixed for weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My house got robbed and I called the police and they were like, is a, is a perpetrator still there? And I was like, no, you know, we clearly got called my boys. I saw the house, I called my boys, they came over. We went through the house with guns, checking, nobody's there. Call the cops. Is the perpetrator said no? Okay, well we're not coming out. Yeah, it's crazy. We have to come to the police station and fill out a report. It's crazy. My mail will come at seven o'clock at night. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. No, dude. So, like we, it happened for for us the other day. Literally a, month, a couple of months ago, we didn't have electric for four days. And there was no storm or anything, right? It was like there was like a bit of a storm, but it's like uh -huh. it like that in England, like. I, I've ne like the longest I've ever not had my electric out in England is literally an, an hour. Oh man, damn. And, and like, Detroit is days it's, sometimes. It's, yeah, days. And also it's like traffic lights just stop working in Detroit. Yeah. And these are the, these are the things that I like, I had to learn obviously. Cause it's like, I'm like, why, oh, man. why is these traffic lights not working? <laughs> like what's, why is there a chair in the middle of the freeway? Like, <laughs> Not a, not a folding chair, like no. a, a chair that you put in your living room. Yeah, a chair. And I'm just yep. like, wow, this is, this is interesting. Keep driving, you'll see the sofa in two miles. Oh, 100%. <laughs> That's true, man. You see all kinds of shit on the freeway. Yeah. It's like, a, it's, I always I used to tease and say it was like a video game. Yeah. Like we had our own, you know, GTA, because you got to avoid obstacles on the freeway. <laughs> you got to try not to hit a pothole oh, so it doesn't. Yeah bust your tire, uh, which they don't fix. They just fill it and then it gets jacked up again so they can get paid the next year. Yeah. Your street lights out. All the time. You know, somebody's stealing your, your package off your porch. You can't even, you can't have something sit on your porch. You just can't. No. It's gone. <clears throat> yeah, you know? we, we had a, we had, uh, so I rent a room out to a couple and he's actually a dope techno producer. Mm -hmm. um, guy called, he goes under. You might actually know his music. It goes under the name as Un U U N. It's like very melodic, -y, melodic, mm -hmm. like hypnotic. It, it's really. I'll send you it. It's really good. But his girlfriend's like an avid, like she works it in, in with plants. So like her day job is to go look after plants in commercial buildings and things like that. Oh and yeah. She ordered. <laughs> she she ordered like a bag of soil on Amazon. Like no word of a lie, that bag of soil got stole. <laughs> what are you gonna do with a bag of soil? <laughs> they must have thought it like it was because it was in Amazon packaging. They thought obviously oh, yeah. it was like something okay. else. They were probably pissed when they opened it, but like, oh yeah, like, <laughs> that bag is that soil. They know it was a mark. Crazy. <laughs> you put it in an Amazon box, it's gone. Yeah, it's crazy. It's gone. I mean. This is the city that, that decided instead of trying to steal your car, we're going to wait until you start it up and get it nice and warm. And then we're going to come and just take it from, because we want the keys too. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, man. There's some innovative criminals. There's some lazy ass criminals, shady. It's all sorts, man. But and it made up, you know, the, the craziest time for me to grow up. And I, I'm not mad. That's why music no. was, was, the, the the respite it was therapy and i think that's what i kind of want to go into because we're talking the truths about detroit and we're talking about the truths of america and i think some people might be like why are you talking so much shit on it but it's like it's not shit it's the truth no it's real talk it's the truth but it's like, like we said i wouldn't be who i am without it exactly so and, i would i would not trade it for anything and i i wouldn't trade it for anyone because it's look what detroit has given us in the last 60 70 years like 100 yeah. years look at what detroit has given the world and i from the motor industry to motown to techno like yeah. it's a city that has given the world three things that we couldn't live without and that's the most beautiful thing about it man and there's so much that people don't know as far as like uh the fashion industry mm -hmm. as far as um, I don't even call it, almost the death metal metal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There was this 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 group I think in Detroit it was called Death. Okay, and it was an all black metal band. Wow, in the seventies, and it was just like out there thrashing mm. shit, and they weren't getting any traction because they were black. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they were called Death. Well, also also look at the hip hop as well. Yeah, like, the hip hop shop. 
yeah. with uh, Maurice Malone mm-hmm. doing his clothing line yeah. in the early days. You know, pre, I'd say pre FUBU and, and Cross Colors and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he was doing it locally. And the hip hop shop was off the chain. They were doing the, the ciphers and the freestyles mm-hmm. and the battles. And you get DJs coming out of there. You get Jay Dilla from there. You get yeah. Dez Andres. You get uh, House Shoes. A bunch of dope ass people, you know, all yeah. the rappers. I forget the fashion. Can... If you look at Carhartt, yeah. like look what Carhartt's done. Yep. No one Car- knows Carhartt. No one knows Carhartt's from Detroit. No. Like, and no they one. weren't even. They weren't even considered fashion. No. You know, it's a work gear company. Well, it's, it's still not in Detroit. It's still it's, not fashion in Detroit, and this is the best thing no, about it. <laughs> no, it's work clothes. Yeah, it's hustling it's clothes. It's straight up work clothes. Yeah. yeah. yeah you I, don't want your shit to tear up, you buy Carhartt. Yeah, literally. And every, It'll last forever. Every, everyone in the winter was wearing big Carhartt coats in Detroit. It's like... It's oh, it yeah. Is. All my family, you work in a plant. I mean, and you don't want to get injured or like... You could walk past something and it could scrape. Yeah, you know, yeah. if you got the right jacket on, you're not worried about it. Mm. But you have on a winter coat, it might cut you or something. Yeah. But yeah, Carhartt was, was the shit, man. It still is. Yeah, but they it do. wasn't fashion. It's, it's not fashion in Detroit. No, not at all. Um, I want to go. I want to talk a little bit more about how Detroit <clears throat> got you to where you're at with your music, and kind of how it started. Um. Mm-hmm. how the i just love hit detroit history so i'm sure you probably spoke about this <laughs> so many times but I, this is just <laughs> selfishly for me um how it kind of started for you with like the introduction of techno and house music or electronic music how did that start for you uh i was in high school yeah and listening to the radio you would hear these weird songs <clears throat> played on the radio by this uh this DJ Electrify Mojo. Electrify Mojo, yeah. And he's essential to every person from my generation and a little bit before. Is he to, still alive? Their... Mojo, yeah. 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 As far as I know, I mean I'm I've never been in contact with him. I never talked to him, but I'm if he had passed away, I'm I'm positive the city would come to a screeching halt. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. To honor that man. Uh, pivotal to everything and anything music-wise yeah. in, in Detroit when it comes to techno. Because he was playing these tracks. And between him and being able to go <clears throat> after school and listen to uh, the scene, watch the scene on TV, it's a yeah. dance show, a local dance show in Detroit, and hear new music mm. that wasn't, it just was different. Yeah. You know, and it just made your body want to move. You know, it was body music back then. And from that point, I had a couple of friends who used to go to this club, you know, as I got older. And it was, they called, it was called Music Institute. Mm. And they kept telling me about it. <clears throat> and I hadn't even, like, I would sneak into clubs if I could yeah. with my friends. But the goal back then was to go to a club so you could drink. <clears throat> You know, in Detroit and most of America, the drinking age is, uh, in all of America, the drinking age is 21 or over. Yeah. So if you don't go to Canada, where it was 18, then you'd have to sneak into a club. Yeah. You know, so we were sneaking in the clubs just to drink, but then my friend was like, yeah, you got to come to this after hours place. It doesn't open until midnight or one. And, you know, and we were like, okay, so went, couldn't get in too young. It's like, damn. So we went back again the next week and then snuck in, like went to the back yeah. and paid the uh, security. <laughs> and I'll never forget. It was dark. You couldn't see shit. It was one strobe light. And then we'll go to the bar. There's no alcohol. I was like, what the fuck? There's juice, like fruit juice. And I was like, what kind of shit is this? <laughs> but then the more you're there, you listen, you start hearing this music, and you're like, man, this is crazy. Mm. And then you're seeing these flashes of pictures because of strobe. So every image you see is like a photo. You didn't know where the DJ was, you know, until you finally enter into the room and you look up and you see the DJ booth is way at the top, mm. you know, and it's lit, you know, backlit. So you could see, and I think it was Derek May who was playing, either him or D-Win. Yeah. And this music was coming out, and I was like, this is 
crazy. Mm. And the best part to me was it wasn't about what people look like. It wasn't about what they were wearing. Yeah. Um, it was free. Mm. It was just everybody was free to be who they wanted to be. And I had snuck into like uh, Club Heaven before when Ken Collier yeah. used to play and places like that. <clears throat> but the Music Institute was like that on steroids, you know, because Heaven was a gay club. Yeah. So it was about the music, but it was straight up gay club. Yeah. <clears throat> so it was like a safe place yeah. for, you know, for the community to be. And the Music Institute was open as well as Heaven, but it was open to everybody. And it was easily accessible to people who wouldn't normally know about Heaven. Yeah. So it was kind of backtracking. You go and hear Derek or, you know, D. Wynn, and then you find out about Ken Collier and you go to Heaven. Yeah. You know, you kind of backtrack it. Where was Heaven? Where? Where, yeah. It was uh, off of Six Mile. Okay. In Woodward. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That place was bananas, man. It was in the hood. It was like on the border, you know, but it was in the hood. It was funny because everybody kept saying, be careful. You know, when I told them, yeah, I'm going to go to heaven, be careful. <clears throat> and I'm like, I'm going to a gay club for the first <laughs> time. Be careful. <clears throat> you know what I mean? And I didn't understand what they meant. I got there. You would never know. Like, honestly, just rolling up in the parking lot, you would never, ever guess it was a gay club. Really? Because it was all hood motherfuckers in the parking lot. Yeah. Like straight up gangsters, you know what I mean? So go in the club, everybody's dancing, everybody's having a good time. Next thing you know, you see some commotion and the crowd opens up a little, the music stops. And this big ass booming voice comes, children, children, if you can't behave yourselves, I'm not going to play any more of this fucking music. I was like, what is going on? So so there was a fight, and somebody pulled out a knife on the dance floor. <clears throat> on the dance floor. I'd never seen that shit happen before. I've been to parties where they got shot up, yeah. or, you know, you just hear a pop out, or somebody couldn't get in. But to be on the dance floor and pull a knife, <laughs> that's some gangster shit. Yeah. <clears throat> that's not weak. You know what I mean? Yeah. You pull out a gun and waving around. To pull a knife and say, Look, my friend, I'm gonna get close to you. I'm gonna stab you. <laughs> and then to not even shut the whole thing down. Because every time in Detroit, yeah. when somebody you hear gunshots, the party's over. Game over, yeah. But somebody pull a knife, King Kyle would just get on the mic and be like, Look, you know, and he would say something and they would be like, Fuck it, put yeah. that shit away. And then go back to the party. Wow. <clears throat> I was like, This is crazy. And then after we're leaving, and there was so much like drama in the parking lot, people arguing, people about to, you know, fight, somebody about to get shot, pulling guns. I was like, this is the wildest club I've ever been to in my <laughs> life. And it's the gay club. That's why everybody's like, be careful, be careful. Heaven ain't no joke. <clears throat> so that's when I, I started to understand that my perception of what gay people uh, act like, what they look like, who they were, was completely off. Yeah. Because anybody could be whoever they wanted to be, and you'd never know. Yeah. You know what I mean? Until they decided to let you know. Yeah. And that's when I knew. I was like, okay. So I went to heaven, I went to the Music Institute, and I got hooked on the music. And I just wanted to hear more of it. Mm -hmm. And I, at the time, the only way you could hear it was either on the radio or if you bought the vinyl. <laughs> so I went to record time. To the record shop you know my friend pete yeah. sneaky pete we call him took me to record time and was like you know this is where you can get all that shit so I went to record time <laughs> and then uh by right if you go up and down six and seven mile there was good record shops there was by right there's chauncey's yeah there was professionals rob hood used to work at professionals moody man and rick Wild used to work at by right um yeah, Huckabee worked at record time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, Al Esther used to work at, uh, what was it, Melodies and Memories. Mm. So there was all these going through you could go. Melodies you know, and Memories and, is still going. <clears throat> man, and you know what's dope about that? It's not just the vinyl, it's all the collectibles. Yeah. The lunch boxes yeah, and the yeah. figurines. Yeah. and the, That's dope. They do cool shit. Gary had a, he had a vision, man. I mean, 
but that's that's true to Detroit, you know, and you go and dig and I used to see Jay Dilla in this record shop. I can't remember the name of it. It was in Ferndale, I remember, on Nine Mile. Mm. And he would just go in there and get a stack and then dig and dig and dig and go back the next day and dig and dig. You know, that's what we do. We go to each whatever record shop that has vinyl, wherever there is vinyl. It doesn't have to be a record shop. Just go. You just go and ask them. Salvation Army, there's a bunch of vinyl there. You go and you dig, mm. you know. But I got into the music that way. And it just gave me this this feeling of, I say freedom all the time, but freedom, a sense of futurism. Yeah. Because I couldn't put my finger on what it was, where it was from. I didn't know Detroit Techno was from Detroit until I met, you know, and saw Derek and Juan. Yeah. And I was like, this, I was so proud. Because I fell in love with the music, and then I go, this shit is from here. Mm. Cybertron is from here, you know? Holy shit. And then I knew all the labels, and i go and visit people. And so it just grew from there. <clears throat> and I ended up playing, like, residencies in clubs. You know, I would, I would buy my vinyl, and I was working full-time. I was going to school. So it was tough because that vinyl cost especially imports. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I would have to justify buying the vinyl, mm. you know, what, what am I buying it for if I can't, you know, make money off of it? Yeah. <laughs> so I had to limit it, you know? And that was tough, cutting down your stack in the, in the <laughs> vinyl shop. Like, damn, I want all these, <laughs> but I can only get these. But then uh, Thomas Barnett uh, used to come by and I would make these mixtapes. Yeah. And I started selling these mixtapes for like five bucks a piece. Mm. And then he took one and gave it to this promoter who was doing a night at shelter in Detroit, who was looking for a resident. And uh, the guy was like, yeah, you know, tell Bone to come down. So I went down and I started playing those, the night was called Love Club yeah. and did it. And it was dope, you know, because I ended up as a resident there <clears throat> and we used to play shelter, St. Andrews, uh, this club in Pontiac called Industry. Mm. Velvet Lounge, Lush and Hamtramck, Motor, of course. <clears throat> but that's how it started. I was doing the residencies and I started getting booked for the warehouse parties. Yeah. And there I am now being able to play with some of the people who I looked at and was like, holy shit, you know, that's Rob Wood. That's Richie Houghton over there. That's such and such. And these guys weren't, they were older than me, but not, you know, that much older. Yeah. So that's what was really cool about it, you know? And then I ended up meeting Matt Mike and, it just it, it flowed, you know, and I got along with pretty much everybody in Detroit. Yeah. Um, uh, there were certain people I could hang out with and a lot of people were just colleagues. Yeah. You know, but I always kept to myself as far as not having a clique or a crew or, mm -hmm. you know, because you would have like Juan Kevin Derrick. Yeah. Stacey Guinea Carl. Um, you know, the waves, they called it. Yeah, I yeah. never fit into any wave. I know, they can't tell me. I still to this day when people say, "What wave of Detroit thing?" I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> just, just I'm like, it. yeah, point something. I don't know. In between, <laughs> I'm in between. I don't know what layers, but it's not on that. It's point something. Yeah. But because I was just individual, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's what helped me too. Is I don't have loyalties to anybody besides myself. Yeah. And the city. You know, but the city's tough. The city will, will it'll raise you, <clears throat> you know, one way or another, but it won't nurture you, you know, past a certain point. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Totally. You know, I like, think, I think from, I think also, I think it's, <clears throat> it's like anything for me, like I, like my, like where I kind of my career really started was in Ibiza for me is I moved to Ibiza when I was 17. And, Damn. Yeah. And started so, <laughs> super young. And like, I, I got a residency by the time, by the age of 18. And like, that's like, I did three, four summers in Ibiza and mm -hmm. got to a point for me where I was like, I knew a bunch of people, but I was just a resident. And, and I had to step out of that to then take a next move in my career to be part of the actual industry rather than just being the resident 
or the what was that do. move i just left just didn't go back yeah. and do a summer and i i didn't go back and play until really until this year like properly oh, properly this year yeah um like i've been back and done shows but like not anything that i would be proud of or would talk about or like rave oh, about yeah. you know what i mean and it's only like i i needed to take i needed to build my career outside of being an ibiza resident see people <laughs> people need to understand that that's the best foundation you can have is being a resident yeah <clears throat> but then you have to graduate you have to graduate and and move forward and that's when you become an artist and you grow. Yeah. And that's what people didn't understand about me is that I had to leave. I had to stop playing Detroit. Yeah. You know, as much as I love Detroit, the scene there fell apart. Mm. It fell the fuck apart. I mean, if you go back and look, <laughs> there's this uh there's this this uh page I follow this account on Instagram. And they had this video, old videos from heaven. And you have this all, you know, black, gay crowd. <clears throat> and they're in there kicking and whacking and voguing and lip syncing. And then you see some old videos of the scene and the new dance show. And even maybe some footage from like some early raves yeah. or from the MI, which uh, there's no video really I know of from MI from Music Institute. But if you look at the scene and you get the vibe of it, <clears throat> it's not me saying, you know, I can't stand that it's not black anymore. I can't stand that it's lost the essence of what it is. Yeah. It's completely flipped. So when I was playing Motor and we had good nights there and I'm bringing in, you know, DJs and it's almost like a proving ground. It wasn't like, you know, come in and dominate Detroit for a night. No, it was like, I'm resident. Mm. You got to play after me. Now what? Yeah. Let's see how good you really are. Yeah, yeah. You know, we got Rolando on this now. We got such, such on this. Now. You play after them. Now let's see how good you really are. That's what it was. It was a proving ground. Mm -hmm. Like they got to come and really prove themselves. Yeah. And that went away. Yeah. So it just became a booking of this person is a big name. Now yeah. we're going to bring him in. And that's that. And that's when I think the turning point, especially with Motor, when Motor decided to book like uh, Paul Oakenfold. Yeah. And Kiyoki yeah. and all that crap. No offense to them, <clears throat> but at the time, that's what everybody was like. What is this crap? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So when that came in, to me, that was the Changed. beginning and the scene because the clubs were already shutting down the warehouse parties. Mm. So that genuine, the authentic vibe and the whole essence of what was rave culture and warehouse parties and house parties and, you know, it was just gone. Yeah. And it had this great divide because you had the house heads. You used to be able to have a party that was house and techno. Yeah, yeah. Then the house heads broke off. Mm. Because what I noticed is the, uh, the crowd that usually grows with the music is house. Yeah. Techno crowd is young, always young. Yeah. You know, there's older people in techno, but there's always a younger crowd. House, the people grow with it. It's mature. It's a bit more uh, like... You can listen to it for longer. Yeah. Let's be honest. Yeah. And and the more that techno became about aggression as opposed to expression, it it just, you know, chipped away a lot of it vibrated a lot of the people yeah. who were funky and soulful out of it. Yeah. So it left a few of us, you know, to try and fight for that that funky aspect, the the technical aspect all the things that made it for me that made it makes it techno. Well, I <laughs> so think, now, yeah, I think, oh, sorry to butt in, but I think that's the, the, the going back into today with what, how people are throwing techno out. Oh. Or it's, it's more of a marketing thing than actually anything. If my personal yeah. opinion, but it's like, I was literally talking to a vision a couple of hours before on, on another podcast, but like it's, not techno. <laughs> no, no. He makes good some great shit. He makes great <laughs> shit. He makes amazing shit. Yeah, the vision makes some really good shit. Yeah, <clears throat> or as we call him in Detroit, A vision. A vision. Yeah, <laughs> I call him A vision as well. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of shit. People say, "Oh yeah, techno." And I'm like, "No, that." Yeah, I'm sorry. And that that argument is just so lost on, on so many that it's getting tired 
for me to even yeah, yeah. stand up for, you know, it's, it's a tough battle. But instead of arguing about it, I'd rather just try and show people my, my opinion through the music and through the, the sets that I play. Well, I think the difference is, is it's about just being really authentically you. And yeah. like only you can be you, only I can be myself. Um, and if I do me the best possible <clears throat> way, no one else can be like me. And for, exactly. for me, like for me growing up, like, I grew up, my like initial, like growing up music in like electronic music was like funky, soulful house, like, <clears throat> defected kind of vibe frankie knuckles all of that kind of larry, oh, larry yeah. that was like my first introduction because i was djing with people that were a lot older than me and they were like showing me vinyl really of like all of the stuff that they love um and no one's ever going to take that away from what who I am. Like that's how I grew up. That's that's what I listened yeah. to growing up. It's the same with you. Like you listen to you grew up with real techno. Yeah. No one's that's, ever going to take that away. Exactly. <laughs> it's, that's a true statement. I mean, that's what's missing mm. is a lot of the newer DJs weren't ushered in. Yeah. weren't introduced to house or techno. They just entered. Yeah. And they entered on their own terms and their own way, which is cool. Yeah. But if you don't have that nurturing or that, you know, that mentor or consigliere or, you know, just even if you haven't uh, train spotted some labels or whatever, <clears throat> then it, you're going to come in and you're not going to have the essence yeah. or understand the essence of what the scene is or what house and techno is. Mm. I mean, I can't say that that's a wrong way to enter, but <clears throat> put it this way. If you start to, if you want to be a chef, <clears throat> you have to understand and you have to practice certain techniques, right? Yeah, totally. Culinary yeah. aspects of science, of of cutting, of yeah. dicing, of, you know, a shift and odd or whatever. Yeah. You have to understand what it is. You can't just go in there and say, well, I cut it this way. Yeah. You know, it's not proper, yeah. you know, and then they don't want to hear that. So it's the same with techno and house and everything else and DJing. You have to understand the foundation mm. respectfully. You should want to. Yeah. You know, and if you don't, then you're going to suffer well, in the long run. I agree. And this is one of the reasons why I started this podcast because, and I say this multiple times, so people that have heard this are probably going to be like, this is a fucking broken record. But <laughs> our genre, the our genre that we work in live in is still so new that the creators of this of the genres are still alive and people aren't talking to them yeah <clears throat> and it's, and it's like like i've been fully aware of who you are for years <laughs> um i've never spoke to you previously to this apart from at amsterdam and occasionally on instagram yeah. But like for me it's just about how can how can the older generation, the people that curated something that we all live and make a living from and enjoy the fruits of the previous generation's labor, like how can we learn and how can we like show people where it came from? Because Otherwise, if people aren't talking about it, you're just going to forget a whole history. Yeah. And like, realistically, like, look at funk and soul. Look at rock. Yeah. Like, realistically, <laughs> like, it's all like, especially like Motown, right? Like, there's there's barely any, there's barely anything <clears throat> apart from the music that's left. Yeah, no one, that's true. No one's there kind of talking about how it came about who wrote the records like i didn't even know the other day until like there was like one guy that pretty much wrote every motown record <laughs> i didn't know this like until the other day and it's like why let's 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 take a bit of time out and let's like actually talk to the people and make friends with the people that actually made our genres 
is so important. I think I think that's it because it's a, such a microwave society. Yeah. That kids, I don't want to say kids, but young people or people entering the scene want to be catapulted to this status. Yeah. And they have no clue, yeah. you know, of what they're entering, the arena that they stepped into. Mm. You know what I mean? So when they do get to this pinnacle and then they turn around and see somebody like me and they go, who is that? Yeah. And they see the respect or they see the the credibility that I have. They're like, damn, you know? So in their own time, it comes. And it has to be because of the way the world works today, it, it's sad, but it has to be a uh, both ways type thing. Mm -hmm, totally. So I, I find myself reaching out to a lot of younger artists yeah. to try and, whether it's just make a connection or mentor them a little or just give them a little, hey, you know, yeah. I'm approachable. You, you know, no need to yeah. think that I'm standoffish or anything. If you ever want to talk about some shit or if you need advice, you know, and it's cool because I talk to a lot of people, you know, mm -hmm. especially a lot of the, the big name younger artists who are out there. And I might just simply say something like, you know, tone down your schedule a little bit because you get sick <laughs> so much, you know, yeah. rest, yeah. you know, just whether it's fatherly advice or, you know, <laughs> Uncle Bone or whatever. I love that. You know what I mean? I love that. It's just, I think it's good because then they don't look at me like that old dude or, you know, yeah. oh, he's he's old school and that's it, you know, because I'll, I can be as old school as they want when they look at me or talk about me, but put them on the turntables next to me and see what happens. You'll fucking destroy them. You know? Them. You'll destroy them. <laughs> I will destroy them all fucking now. <laughs> You think I'm old school? Watch this shit. No. Yeah, but that's but, the difference between old school and new school is that you you had to do shit because this, everyone oh, was doing shit. Like that's a good point. You had you had to stand above everybody because that was it. Like realistically, uh, there wasn't there wasn't any. No one was making real edits of records because you had to press it on vinyl. Like yep. so, like the whole DJ mentality is so different to what it is now where like you have to actually be a DJ. Like you had to, you couldn't just wave your hands no. or conduct the crowd. And even, dance. yeah. And even for me, like I can DJ, but also like all of most of my sets is my own music. So I know that nobody else is going to play the same set as me. I know that nobody's yeah. going to play the same records for me. That's the difference between what how i used to dj and how i dj now but like yeah. if you're if you're a d proper dj like <clears throat> you have to learn to dj and there's not <laughs> there's not many proper djs out there nowadays no i mean it, it's sad there's a lot of famous djs but not a lot of proper djs yeah you know i mean in detroit think of it this way if you name or think of any two detroit techno guys and you put them side by side and Name me two Detroit people who sound exactly the same. Yeah. There's none. None. Everybody wanted to be an individual. Everybody wanted to sound different. They wanted their own sound, their own style. Which I, which I love. You know what I mean? I love <laughs> about it. And that, that's techno to me. So to have people come and try and everyone sounds the same is, is foreign to Detroit people. Is, is it, uh, this is kind of where I'm going to question you. Is it techno? Mm -hmm. Or is it about being an artist? You mean wanting to be different? Yeah. Or the way people are sounding the same? About wanting to be different. Is it just a techno thing? Or is it just about, act, like you guys, like I, I find people that want to sound different, they're actual artists, they're actual people that, and this, isn't, this, might, this might really annoy people for me saying this, like we've, I feel like we've all copied people at some point in our careers just because that's what's happened. But yeah. I, I think the real, for me anyway, is like the real artists that stay ground for the, they stay the course of time is because they've done something different. Like look at, look yeah. at the Detroit guys. Look at you, Juan, Moody Man, like Kev, like Rob, like they're all done their own thing and they're still going. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not because yeah. that's not because they're the, the creators of, of a genre. That's not part of it is, but it's because they've just yeah. done their done their own thing. And I yeah. think how many people have you seen 
start techno, start in techno, and then their careers end very pre five years later. They're not doing techno. They're not doing music. <laughs> I've seen so many. Exactly. And so many of them have been on like the 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 focus of the genre yeah. for a year or two years, yeah. and then they fall off and disappear. Yeah. And a lot of them, some of them still play, but you don't even hear their name or exactly. see, you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, it's, yeah, it is more about being an artist. For me, it was more techno because <clears throat> in Detroit, what we, what we consider techno is different. Yeah. You know what I mean? Massively. Techno is, is a lot different. It was, it was all part of riding around in your car, listening to the radio or clicking your porch light on and off at midnight when Mojo was on or, it's a culture. you know. It was a culture. Yeah. It wasn't just the music. <clears throat> it was the warehouse parties. It was the raves. It was all of it combined. Yeah. You know, it was like uh, a Thursday night, you know, house party. It was uh, floods, you know, it was still open. Yeah. This is super popular restaurant, you know, in downtown. And it's just, you know, being a house head and, yeah. and doing a house dances. And it was all that culture. That was all techno to us. You know, like I remember Moody Man once he was, I was talking to him and he was like, yeah, bro, I, I think I'm going to make some techno. And I was like, you already make techno. Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> he was like, you think so? I said, hell yeah, that's techno. Yeah. You know, because them young sconies, if that ain't techno, what is? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. This just the whole culture, but it is being as individuals being artists, you know, I think that's what speaks loudest and it goes back to Motown, mm. you know, because they wanted to out dance each other and they wanted to out sing each other. And yeah, that's the artist in you coming yeah. through the bubble of yeah. Motown or the bubble of techno. I think it's also comes from, it, uh, tell me if I'm wrong and it may be out of place in me saying this, but it comes from the struggle as well. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, I think struggle breeds the best artists. 100%. It's sad, but it's true. You know, 100%. I mean, the best artists, my, all my favorite artists struggled. Yeah. All of them. None of them had it easy. Yeah. Zero. You know, even to this day, new artists that I find and I go back and I look at their career, they struggle. Yeah. You know, and <clears throat> that's... That's just, it goes back, it goes to how I even make music. Mm. You know, I don't go in the studio and make a track. No. I go and I just let out a, a feeling or an emotion or an idea mm. or something weird. And if it just so happens to be danceable, then good. Yeah. I structure it in a way where it can, some people can dance to it. You know, if you take the kick drum out of all of techno and you listen to it, the most artistic the most beautiful music is it's going to be Detroit techno. It's yeah. so much soul in there. But if you take the kick away from what's happening now. There's nothing else. I have. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, a wobbly bass line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're so true. I think I, for me, that's the litmus test. If I can take the kick out and people still dance to that track or yeah. they groove or they vibe to it, that's some good techno. You know, it doesn't have to be super funky. It doesn't have, it could be new wave. Yeah. It could be on the edge of what, what people call trance, yeah. you know, euphoric almost, you know, yeah. to that point. But if the kick is the only element, then something's wrong. Mm. Something's definitely wrong. Yeah. That's the way I see it. I don't disagree with you, man. Uh, for me, <laughs> for me is I've evolved as whoever i am in music and as a person like soul is all i want to put into a record it's all i want to put in it's like that's how i found you yeah you were making i started playing that remix you did of the percolator mm. oh really did you and i was like good god who is this will Clark? i was like he lit this song on fire and it was just the perfect nod to the song mm. it didn't step on it too much it actually made it better that's tough when somebody can remix wow. a classic and make a better version I'm not saying it's better than the original but it stepped it up it updated yeah. it you know and after that i was like okay what else what else will clark what you got what you got you know and that's when i started going back and then i got the hallelujah through and i was like okay i said somehow somewhere i'm gonna play this in a techno set mm. people won't get it but yeah it's gonna happen 
<laughs> Thank you. No, it means you a lot. Know? It means a lot. And it's something that I've battled with through my career because <clears throat> like I, my first like real success in, in music was through Dirty Bird. Um, yeah, that's right. And, and I love those guys and I love what it did for my career, but I, I couldn't really put that into my records in Dirty Bird. It wasn't mm. really like a soulful record label. It was more like, yeah. Yeah, just yeah. make as much bassy as we possibly can or booty records or like ghetto tech records, if you know what I mean, which I still love, like Dion, DJ Rush, like uh. all, all, of those, <laughs> all of that shit I love. Um, but like, that was the thing is like, how can I, when I had to kind of decide, okay, let me step away from Dirty Bird and let's make something that I, that actually feels like me. Yeah. And that's when the record started to come a lot and, and the records were a lot you let shit on fire bro i mean i was getting track after track from you and i was like damn thank you and man. it's funny i play something and then now the litmus test is because you know I, I play stuff out all the time if i feel it and yeah. then i see how people react but if i play it at home and my wife comes over who's that i'm like yeah <laughs> and there's very few times that she'll ask me who is that yeah and about at least four times it was you oh wow and I just look at her and I go, Will Clark. She's like, no. Like, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah, Mate, we should do something. We should do something. We should get in. I think that would be I'd dope. Love that. I'd love it, man. People would be like, oh, what the hell? That's the beauty of it. Yeah. See, that's what happens when we talk, huh? Yeah. No, I think that's the thing as well. And it's, it's that's what, the, again, it's the whole point of this podcast for me is sitting down with people that I wouldn't necessarily sit down with in, well, Everybody that I sit down on this podcast, I would never sit down for an hour and a half and yeah. not have any distractions, not have any converse, any like phones, anybody talking to me. Like this is, I, we would never have had this conversation. Even if we were at dinner, we would That's never true. have had this conversation. And I think like, yeah. this is why I do these conversations is because like, we need to talk. People need to talk. Like we can't it's just really cool. can't just be in the studio. We can't just be DJing. Like, yeah, I I want to I want to make connections. And selfishly, I want to make ca connections in this industry, and I yeah. want to learn from from everybody, whether it's new and old, new or old. And yeah. I, I think it just allows everybody to kind of this this will this is similar to music to a certain extent, where this will last for the rest of this will last for longer than us this conversation yeah, yeah and that's true and i hope in 50 years time when we we're not on this planet like people can still listen to this conversation and i hope people sample you talking about shit and i hope people <laughs> sample me talking about shit and i hope people are like damn dj bone like and i think that's what's really important to me is like just do cool shit yeah I mean, I'm on that tip too. Yeah. Uh, of we we got a <laughs> we got contacted through uh, Goldie's management. Wow! And they were saying, you know, talking to An, and they're like, yeah, uh, we should get Bone and Goldie together to do a project. And then you know, she was like, oh yeah, of course, you know. So she talked to me, and I was like, hell yeah. And then nothing materialized, mm -hmm. and then. It, after a few months, well, you know, maybe the, when COVID hit, you know, then they got back in touch and they were like, yeah, so we still want to do something with Bone. And so initially we we're going to do a back to back yeah. and just, you know, so Goldie messaged me on Instagram. He's like, give me a number, man. You know, I need to talk to you. Yeah. So he hit me up. He was like, look, man, we need to shake this shit up. We need to do something, you know, techno need that blah, blah, blah. I was like, all right, let's do it. He's like, I came to you, Bone, because, you know. I, there's a lot of Detroit people I love so much. He's like, but I, I fuck with you. You yeah. know, come on, let's do it. So it turned from one back to back. And as soon as we put the word out, that's when people are like, can we get that? Can we get I that? Bet. I bet. And we did the tour and it was so much fun, man. Mm. And the crowds, I mean, to be able to go and play whatever we want, that's what I, I live for. Yeah. You know, I always have curveballs in my sets. But to have a whole set of curveballs and nobody knows what the fuck. I always tell people, I I really don't want my crowd to listen to me. I want them to anticipate me. I want yeah. to anticipate, like, what is he going to do next? Mm. 
not just be in the beat and be like, oh, this is a cool track. I hope he plays another one like this. I hope he plays another one like this. You know? Yeah. The kick, the kick went out. The kick went out. When's it coming back? <laughs> When's it coming back? It's back. It's back. It's back. You know what I mean? So I, yeah, I, I want people, I want to play something where people look at each other and they're looking at their friends like, did you just see that or hear that? And now they're on edge. So yeah. now you're kind of like, it's like a good movie. Yeah, yeah. Like, whoa, yeah. what the fuck is going to happen next? You know, suspense. Mm -hmm. I miss that. Yeah. But with me and Goldie, it was bananas. And I, I want to carry that energy because we're going to do it again next year. Amazing. But I, if more projects, so me and you, we have to Let's do it. shake it up. We got to shake it up, Will. Let's do it. Also, <laughs> when, when, <laughs> when you do that Goldie thing, please let me know because that would be the only rave I want to come to. <laughs> you like, brought it full circle like growing up in like i'm from bristol in the uk so oh shit yeah, yeah. so like growing up with i never liked drum and bass as a kid like i was no? i was opposite because all my friends loved it and they always mm -hmm. tried to get me to listen to it and i was always trying to get them to listen to house and techno and like oh. i kind of always had this battle with them and i'd play like house parties like every summer I, in, in fact, in this place, like this used to, where I live now, it used to be like an old cow shed. And mm -hmm. like, I used to throw a summer party every, every, at the end of every school year. And like, everyone would ask me to play drum and bass and I'd be playing techno. And <laughs> nope, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually I was like, I love drum and bass. I like gave into it and I love it. And oh, man. Goldie is, has a, a special place in in that scene for me massively yeah um, that brother i mean he's if any if anybody there's a bunch of people who i consider honorary detroit and he's at the top does he so so when you guys play do you both play techno yes sick. and we play drum and bass sick yeah so he he plays techno i play techno he plays drum and bass i play drum and bass we play hip-hop no we play uh he dropped at Mantro Jazz, I'll never forget it. I was playing something, and then he mixed in, and then next thing you know, I just heard, let me clear my throat. I was like, what did he just Shit. do? I was just like, I didn't know what was going to happen. And I'm like in shock looking at him. And then I turned and looked, and the place erupted. And I was in shock still. So he played it, and then he backed off the tables looking at me like, okay, now what you got? <laughs> and I was like, what the fuck? Because we would just go back and forth like a battle. Yeah, yeah. He would even tell An, I play something, and the place would go crazy. And he'll be like, can you go to her? He's like, I got something for his ass. I got something for his ass. So he played that, and it went nuts. So I come up, and I was like, what am I going to mix into this shit? But then I was like, okay, first off, I know it's a call and response, you know? Say ah, 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 and I pulled it down, and the whole place went ah, 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 ah. and he looked and he was just now nah, he's in shock. Yeah, yeah. So he's like, "What the fuck?" And he knows what's coming up, and it's like, "If y'all want to party like we party," and then it has this part where they make everybody freeze. Yeah. So he's looking at me, and he's like, "No, he's not gonna do it." And I'm like this, and then it says freeze, and I just stopped the record. The whole crowd, people had phones, cell phones up, and everything. They just all froze. That's so good. And then I just let it go. And then he was like, okay, all right, you got it. <laughs> That's such a moment. We have it on video too. And I was, I'm in awe of the fact that he played it. Mm. And that creativity, just him playing it made me think on, you know, was on my toes. Like, okay, what can I do to bring it to the next level? So all our sets are like that, like yeah. just going up and up and up. I mean, it was crazy. He was playing, uh, what was that Feral Munch? Yeah, yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Get the fuck out! Because so, I played Godzilla, yeah. like Godfather. Was, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dun, I was dun, just dun, about dun. to tell you say that. And he and he looked at me like, okay, okay. And then it's going, dun, 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 dun. and I'm all hyped up, like, yeah. Dun, 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 dun. And then he just, fuck you. <laughs> so I don't know if you remember the Kill Frenzy did a remake of Godzilla years uh -huh. ago um it's it's really good i'll send it to you if you if you've not heard yeah, it. yeah, it's yeah. really good and him and i were playing in australia together years ago um and we didn't know but that godzilla record or his version of the godzilla record was like the 
the tune of that club. Like, and we didn't have a clue. <laughs> and we were playing back to back. And then he played this, he played it. And literally it was, have you played in Rev, Revs in Melbourne? I think, is, wait, is it the basement or no? It's like the day party uh, on no, the Sunday. No, no, no. Okay. But it's like an institution of, <laughs> in Australia, as much of an institution can be in Australia. Um, <laughs> but like, and the place went fucking mental. Like literally oh, had people hanging off the like the ceiling. It's it's oh, it's quite like man. a lounge. There's like chairs, people jumping off the chairs, and you're just like I, I was like, dude, what the fuck is happening? And it 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 doesn't really happen that often, things like that. No. It really doesn't. And I think for me, that is the whole reason why I do it. Is for those moments when you're like you could like you could play that re record in multiple situations and it wouldn't have that response but yeah. because you're playing it in a back-to-back -back, it's you and goldie it's you're playing techno you're playing drum and bass you're playing hip-hop and then somebody drops a bomb like that and you're like game over it would never happen and it, like you play that in a hip-hop club every weekend it gets played every weekend in a hip-hop club yeah yeah they don't get the response that you would get no no that's the best no. thing about it. <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's the curveballs. So I just thought about it. I was like, well, if we do a whole set that's like that, what's going to happen? Yeah. <clears throat> Especially if people seeing, just seeing Goldie play techno and hearing him. Wow. Yeah. And then when he dropped that uh, redemption, yeah. <clears throat> that sampled the Galaxy to Galaxy. I don't know that. Oh, my God. I'll send it. Record. Yeah, please do. It's, I was shocked because... It loops. It's like ding, 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 and it just loops over. And then I'm like, oh, he's playing some U R. Then all of a sudden, this vocal comes kicking in. If you ever feel it, and I was like, what the fuck is this? I was going bananas. Like, what is this? Yeah, he was just nodding his head, pointing at it, like, yeah, bro. I love yeah. that. So he worked with Matt Mike on that. Michael and him sampled the Galaxy of Galaxy. Wow. And. It's just the most emotional track oh, you can hear. Nice. And if you drop it at the right time, it's it's just, it's beautiful. It's a, it's a tear jerk. So he played that and I was like, fuck, dude, this is crazy. If, but like if, you said, time and place, because, you know, anywhere else you play, they're going to think it's Tech House. Yeah. Because it has a vocal. Yeah, of course. You know, because it's Techno with a vocal. And be like, oh, that's Tech House. No, yeah. that's some Detroit shit. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Mo moving Detroit, moving to Detroit changed 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 everything for me musically, and uh, like, I is it I, the city itself, like the vibe yeah. of the city? Yeah, I think yeah. it's like if you if you come to where I live in the UK, it's like it's like where you live in in the Netherlands. It's like farmland. I live in the middle yeah. of, middle of nowhere. That's I can it. I can. There's not a shop for five miles. I can walk. <laughs> I can walk down to the local village, or well, I have to drive to the local village. But I know everyone. Like everyone knows yeah. you. Like it's very like, and I obviously I, I lived in LA before. I lived in New York before, and I love New York. New York's my favorite place in the world. But <laughs> Detroit just it changed my music. Just changed completely, yeah. and I think I, I believe it, man. It's it's a cold, dark city, really. In especially in the winter, and yeah, it just. It kind of <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah. My wife said it's just Gotham. Yeah, I mean, it it's, is. It's seriously it really is. like like nothing else. Yeah, it's and it, the thing that amazes me is it, it still amazes me every time I drive down Woodward. It's like six p.m. on Woodward, like the biggest, the the, mo the main street in Detroit is six p.m. Yeah. and you you don't drive past another car, and you're like, no, what the it's fuck? A ghost town. It's a ghost town still. Yeah, everything closed. Yeah. yeah, it's mad. It's absolutely mad. But the only is... thing open is like what fast food and liquor stores. Yeah, yeah, or a church. Yeah, yep, that's true. Church next to a liquor store. <laughs> <laughs> that's so Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that's I true. I love it. I love it, man. Dude, we've uh -huh. just done an hour and forty-five minutes. Um, oh, that's it. No. <laughs> <laughs> I we could go on it. forever, but 
I have really, really enjoyed this conversation. So thank you very much for coming on, man. Thank you. Hey, anytime, man. Anytime you want part two, let's do it. Let's do it. We My will pleasure, definitely do seriously. It. Um, before we go, let's do the promo. You've just got a new EP come out on Fabric. Yes. Which is dope. I love it. Um, thank you. <clears throat> what, what's it called again? Black, Black Market. Black Market, yeah. Yeah. Um, go listen to it people <laughs> how, how, how can people follow you on social media how can people come to see your shows how can people find out about all of that uh social media is dj bone 313 mm. is is my handle um for my shows i have a regular event further at uh radian in amsterdam i call it my my vegas <laughs> You know, that's my residency. So we do events there. Uh, it was monthly, but it just wasn't working as well because I traveled too much yeah. to schedule it properly. So we do like maybe five times Amazing. a year right now. And the next one we have coming up is New Year's Eve cool. with a really heavy, heavy hitter lineup. But not like, ooh, look at these names. Yeah. Just when you look at the naming, be like, oh, yeah. they're dope. They bring it. So that's what's happening. Uh, right now I'm in the U.S. I'll be in L.A. this Saturday. And then I'm going to be in New York. Um, what is that? The 18th? Yeah, the 18th. And then the 20th? I think this is yeah. coming out. This is coming out a bit later. Let me just check when this is coming out. This is coming out on the 22nd of November. Oh, okay. Uh, no. No. Uh, Tim Division Bondi Tim 29th of November this is coming out well at least I'll get the New Year's Eve yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we have a hell of a, a dope ass New Year's Eve plan cool man dude uh, I, I must really I must say playing for you guys in Amsterdam like it was it reignited playing again for me it, no it, I mean, yeah man it's like I, you know how it is like you tour the summer you kind of really put the fucking work in and your schedule is non-stop and it's sometimes it can just like get not monotonous but you're just doing shows like if you know it's what I mean. hectic yeah it's super hectic and there's no time yeah. to like reevaluate everything and i played a show with oliver heldens on the wednesday which was great. Like I love playing shows like that because it's a completely different crowd to what I would usually play in front of. And it's like, I can try and win people over and try and get them to be my fans. <laughs> but yeah. like playing at further Radian for the homeless homies party, it was like, I came out of there going, that was fucking amazing. Like it was- That's so it was cool. Truly I'm glad, amazing. man. That's our, that's our mission. Like the reason we started further is to bring that experience every single time. Yeah. It's- We've had, and honestly, it's, it feels good. I'm, I'm happy to hear you say that because so many DJs, when they come and play, they say that. They're like, I felt so good playing there. And when I left, I just wanted to come back. Yeah. You know, I, just the vibe, the atmosphere, you know, everything. And we want that. We want the sound, the vibe, the, the, the people, the entry mm. from beginning to end, you know, it's about the whole complete experience. It's not just about me. It's not just about the club. It's about everything involved. The people who work there. Yeah. You and, know, and that room really is important. just spe that the room that I played in was just special, man. <laughs> it's so special that room. Nothing like it. I don't want to <clears> play <throat> in another room in that club. Like, cause I, I looked around <laughs> and I was like, yeah, they're all cool, but this room's the fucking best. And it's I like, love it. it's like, <clears throat> it was just something goodbye man it's just it was timing as well it's like i needed it so, so thank that's you. cool thank you buddy. we appreciate you we really appreciate, we appreciate you man because you you came through like great. a champ man you great. were like whatever you need yeah. you know i loved it man i loved it and how can is there a way people can donate to the homeless homies thing ever or is it just yeah events? yeah let me check to donate to homeless homies well, <laughs> i tell you what Send me the links and I'll put it okay. in the comments below cool. or in the description. So if anyone wants to wants to donate to that, please hit the link below. That's perfect. Um, Thank you, bro. And and we'll push that as well. Dude. That'll work. Keep safe. See you soon. 
Uh, all right. Take care, man. Thanks again. Big love, man. See, See ya. Soon, mate. I love that conversation. Thank you to, for DJ Brain for coming on. Um, please go follow him. Please go listen to his music. Please go see him play. He is a boss DJ. Um, and also please donate Homeless Homies. Link is in the description. Um, keep safe. See you next time. <laughs>